Hello, everybody. Um, I believe I'm streaming now. And I just want to say um, I'm happy to be talking to all you people because basically, if you know the brand, then then you're one of the cool kids is the way I always see it. Because as a macro photographer and videographer, uh, you know, I've spent years in all parts of the world taking photos and videos and using whatever Canon and Nikon could come up with for macro photography. Uh, just some of my background. Um, my name is Phil Torres. Uh, I started my career as an entomologist. I worked in the Amazon rainforest for two years and I still go back every year multiple times. And now I do a lot more science storytelling. I work on television. I do a lot of videos and photos and all that kind of thing. And it's a blast. And the stories I love to tell are the little ones, both uh, mostly just literally little. They're uh, little insects or the things I love and spiders and all those things. But the stories down there are so big and so interesting and so unappreciated. And that's what really got me into macro photography and videography is I wanted people to appreciate these things just as much as I do. And so it was, it was basically trying to tell the story, the science that I loved and the species that I loved. So um, absolutely loved them. And I love telling their stories. And the best way to tell their stories is to get their perspective, the perspective of an in insects and kind of get up close to them. And that's where macro photography and videography can really, really shine. Um, so let me show you some of my first images I ever took. They were uh, of interesting subjects, but really bad photos. I can fully admit to that. So um, this is a eroded moth cocoon. It hangs on this long string. It's about 10 centimeters, 15 centimeter long string. You can see there at the top. And then it weaves this incredible clear basket. And then the little pupa is inside. Absolutely what a gem, but absolutely what a bad photo. It's low resolution. Didn't really do anything but take a photo of it and think it was a good photo. Um, let's see what else we got here. So uh, this was a fantastic caterpillar I saw on a stream at night. Uh, I lived in the Amazon for a couple years, so I would see these things all the time. And during my research, I was like, I got to take a photo of everything because I, I loved it. And it was a really cool yellow and blue caterpillar. But again, the photo kind of falls short. Um, it's just you could see it was the on camera flash just directly on, not really macro, just of a small thing. And then here's a real gem it is uh, this Phylomedusa vilantii tree frog. They're known as monkey frogs because they don't hop like a frog. They crawl like a monkey. And you could see the shadow of my flashes in the shot. Clearly just didn't balance the light, didn't frame it very much, just thought I was taking a good photo of something. But to be honest, again, I wasn't. Um, but this was something that I decided I really wanted to work on because I was in the rainforest. I spent about two years there working on different research projects, and I really wanted to tell their story. So I got my first macro lens, which was a 100 millimeter lens, which I recommend for anybody looking to get into macro. That's the lens to start with. It's just a really good length that you can do a lot with, not to mention you can um, you can take great portraits of people too. So it's a, it's a bugs and people lens. I, I like it for that. Now, um, the interesting thing was as I took more photos to be able to explain my science, I actually started to be able to do science with my photos. Now, you'll see what I mean when I show you this. Um, this is an interaction between an ant and can you tell what it's crawling on? It is a wing of a butterfly. Let's get to the butterfly photo here. There we go. So we have this really crazy interaction between ants and butterflies. How do you document that? I couldn't even get close enough with my eyes to be able to tell what was happening here. Um, but what I did do was take a lot of photos. Photos like this that just kind of made this interaction really confusing. And it was... Uh, Part of the puzzle that I was trying to figure out slowly until I got to photos like this. So now we can kind of see what's happening here. We have butterflies, their long proboscis, and we have ants and their mandibles, and they're all going after the same thing. So um, 
As I was saying before, I was started to use photography to inform my science, not just my science to inform, uh, not just, you know, the other way around, where I was taking photos just to inform the public. Now all of a sudden these photos were informing me about the subjects that I was studying. So, um, here's an example. We have an ant crawling on top of something. All right, so, uh, what the heck is this ant doing on top of the butterfly's wing? Well, what are these ants doing with that butterfly's caterpillar? Uh, look at this interaction that we're seeing here. It just kind of looks like a cluster of butterflies and a cluster of ants, but what's really happening? Well, as we got closer, we started to see the proboscis of this butterfly and the mandibles of the ants. They were both drinking from the tip of this bamboo shoot in the Amazon. So that was confusing for us because we said, why were butterflies and ants hanging out. Well, there's my buddy Aaron Pomerantz, who I worked on this with. A lot of these photos are his as well. Um, it has to do with the ants and the caterpillar stage. So the ants and the caterpillar, basically, they have a mutualistic relationship. And then you get to this stage, and the ants are here at the back of a butterfly expecting something in return for protecting the butterfly. They don't get anything. Um, here you could see the ant in a first installed three millimeter larva feeding from that same little tip of a bamboo shoot. There must be some really strong sugars or amino acids coming out of that plant. And the big, big thing that hit us was this shot. What we're seeing here is a butterfly stealing out of the mouth of an ant. Now this is the only photo of this behavior ever documented, ever. If you have a photo like this, send it my way. I'd love to see it. But essentially, what was happening here is the butterflies are actually, it's a type of parasitism called kleptoparasitism, where they're stealing from the ants themselves. So by taking photos, I was able to document behaviors that had never been seen, and that was really cool to me. Now, let's talk about Lauer for a second. Um, this lens, I'm sure you all recognize it. This is the 24 millimeter probe lens. It's bananas. It is so weird. And when I first got it, this is me kind of opening it up and looking at the top. Uh, you can see the lens up there. You can see the LED lights in a circle there as well. And it's just the weirdest thing ever. And I love that somebody at Laua thought to invent this thing. Now, when we go to this part, you can see the aperture on that outer ring. And I generally keep the aperture around 14 because I want as much light in there as possible. And then the bottom ring is both the focus and the zoom factor, the macro factor. So that's one that I play with regularly as I'm filming something to try to determine how I want to use that. So it's a challenging lens for sure, but it's one that when you're trying to take an inventive shot or try to be creative or really push the envelope when it comes to macro videography or photography, this is one that is just a blast. So let's put some macro lenses to work. Here's one of my favorite shots ever. I have a wide angle macro on my camera and I manually focus to about you know, four or five centimeters and then I had to follow this butterfly, chasing it through the bushes to try to keep it in focus because autofocus doesn't work like that. And then this shot is shot on the probe lens. Look at that perspective that you get where you were just feel like you were living at that same level that the butterfly is. You're seeing the flower as the same size. And this shot was very hard to get, both of these were, but using the right kind of macro lens where you have that wide angle and you're able to get really close and show the environment like this shot. And then using the probe lens where you could get right up on something without scaring it because it's not like I'm really close to it with my big camera, it's just the probe itself is out there. So that one was a blast to work with. Uh, and then we got ants. Let's see what we can play here. Oh, first we have okay. So this isn't the one I've been studying, but it's just the weirdest thing you'll ever find in the jungle. And it is uh, still a bit of a mystery. We know it's a spider egg. By taking footage using the probe lens, I'm able to kind of get more clues as to what its structure is for. But ants, look at this shot. Taking leaves from a tree way up tall, and now a bunch of them are bringing it down. This one got confused and was bringing it up, so... I, I got some footage of it, but these ants are just fascinating behaviorally, and to, and to film them 
I, is something I just didn't think was quite possible because you have to get a lens right next to them in order to do that. And uh, using the, the Lower Probe lens, I was able to do that. So I don't have the probe lens with me now, but I do have the selfie stick as an example. And one of the challenges that you get with using the lens is shake because any shake that happens back here kind of gets amplified up here. So I do things like rest it on the ground, I'll rest it on my hand and kind of do this version, or use a tripod or a slider. But once you master that, um, for filming I shoot in high shutter speed, so 60 frame per second, 120 frame per second, so I can slow things down, take out a little shake, and it's so worth it once you kind of master that because the shots you get are crazy. So uh, let's see. Better perspective what of what got. end of the lens right here will attach here it to a camera the there lens. and it allows us basically a bug's perspective and this lens is brand new very few people have used it and I'm pretty sure no one has ever used it on leaf cutter ants in the rainforest like this so the footage we're about to get has basically never been seen before and I'm pretty excited to start getting recording no one ever said filming leaf so cutter look, ants with the, the brand new light. experiment I have the LED panel light up there, which is allowing tons and tons of light to really fill these ants and really let me get the footage of it. And the ants were kind of everywhere. I was very excited. Footage is worth it. Okay, and there's more of the footage. Now, remember how I was saying it can be kind of tough to use it because it shakes a little bit? What I was using was the actually edge of the tree that I would just kind of drag the lens along right in front of an ant and using that I was able to get this footage of basically just their perspective of what their life is like as an ant in the rainforest. Ah, I loved it. It was just one of the best days ever to be able to look at this footage and, and just be so stoked at what we captured there. Better perspective and of what life is like more as a leaf cutter ant. I'm inside. This is so crazy. Look at that. So yes, that's the inside of a leaf cutter ant nest. You could see that one holding onto a leaf still. And that's the advantage of the probe lens. You could stick it in places and get really creative and just get these incredible natural history shots of wildlife out there that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get. Now my favorite little shot, ooh, can't give it away too soon, is of this. Now, yes, I work with insects, but I also love me a good frog. And this is a type of dart frog that you find in the Peruvian Amazon, and it loves bamboo, and it lives inside bamboo. So, how do you film something that is a tadpole inside bamboo, breeds inside bamboo, lives and calls inside there? Because bamboo is a, is a thin tube like that. You use a lens that is also a thin tube. So after dreaming of getting the shot for years, finally when I got the probe lens, I was like, I know what I gotta do with it. And I stuck it inside that bamboo shoot and got this shot. Look at him come. Look at that. So that was just a dream shot come true. And you can see the lens worked perfectly because it has a light on it. So I was able to light up that area that otherwise wouldn't get um, wouldn't get lit up because you, you need, you know, it's completely dark inside there. So it's not like you could stick a light and a lens in there. So when you have a light on the lens, that's when it really comes out. So um, there's a little bit of background, a little bit faster because we lost connection before. And let me answer some questions here. So do you plan to shoot the ant kid in particular and then decide to get the probe lens? Or did you get the lens first and decide to experiment with the ants? It was a bit of both. I, I think I'm always dreaming of really cool shots that I've maybe seen in documentaries or things that I see out there when I'm in the jungle and say, ah, oh, I wish I could get that shot. But really it was once I got the lens that my creativity just took off. And... I was able to say, okay, what can I do with this? And when I realized the leaf cutter ant nests generally have a pretty big hole that when you can peek in with a flashlight and you could see a lot of action in there, I was like, okay, this is the perfect example 
of how we could use this to capture something that is rare to see. Um, so I think it was it was a bit of both, but really it was once I got the lens and once I saw it was out there, all of a sudden these these opportunities showed themselves because before it wasn't even possible to get a shot like that, and now it is. Um, so I think there might be a couple more questions, but uh, I just want to say that um, I've used three of Lawa's lenses and been really happy with all of them. I know some people are a little hesitant with the manual focus part of it because a lot of stuff that you could buy from Canon or Nikon is autofocus, but what you realize is that when you're working with wildlife and these small things, the manual focus is often what you want because you kind of set the frame, you move back and forth because the focus is so narrow as it is that you're trying to get just an eye in focus or um, the face in focus or something. So it's um, it really hones your craft and it really makes you a better photographer and really think about your shot before because those little movements you got to do as a macro photographer or videographer oftentimes rely on you moving rather than the lens or the com or the camera's computer adjusting the focus there. Uh, let me check on Facebook. We might have a couple more questions here. Let me see. Comments. Um, expand this a little bit. Uh, so, someone asked me, "Do I think of the 25 millimeter 2.55x Ultra Macro?" Um, I think it is pretty awesome. I haven't used it myself, but I've seen other people use it. And that is a macro range that is so challenging to work with, uh, just in general, because it's really, really hard to see. You basically get lost. The second you look through the viewfinder, you're so zoomed in that it's, it's almost hard to find what you were looking at. So it takes tons and tons of practice to know when you see something in front of you here, if you look through the lens and you move there, you're going to find it again. So it takes a lot of practice, but the photos I've seen from it are remarkable, and for its price point, it's it's even better. And it's something that is definitely on my list for um, upping what I have right now. Um, I currently have the 65 millimeter uh, 1 to 5x from Canon. It's many years old, and it was something that um, I got some good use out of. But it's the technology hasn't advanced in you know 10 15 years so when Lawa came out with their version of something similar with that type of magnification i was uh, pretty excited if you could say um so when it comes to batteries and power uh, i got a question about that um i will generally bring kind of a, a couple battery bricks so things that I can either charge my phone or charge my computer or I can use to light up the probe lens as well because it, it has that little USB input. So I use one of those phone chargers basically and plug it into that and then I'm able to shoot with it all day long. So um, that's something I use. Uh, but otherwise, most of the field stations I stay at, they got generators so I'm able to, to um, charge things as I go. But yeah, I always have extra, extra, extra batteries because you just don't know. If the lightning hits and the power goes out, you want to have extra batteries on hand, both for your flash, uh, for your camera, for um, your computer, if you have to offload footage and, and videos and that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Do I do focus stacking? Um, I do some focus stacking, and I generally do handheld. I went to a seminar actually by... Uh, Thomas Shahan a few years ago, that guy's such a legend. I was always amazed at the amount of focus he had, and so he kind of taught me the technique. So I've done it a few times. I do it with um, with certain things that are, like the silk hands that I work with, certain spider egg structures or those things. And it's, it's not super easy, but the software kind of makes it easy for you. So once you get enough shots kind of going back and forth, and it's these really, really subtle movements, that are kind of full body movements where you just kind of inch in like that. Um, 
you get the, the results are really amazing. It, it, like everything in macro photography, these new techniques you learn take a lot of practice. But when you plug it into the software and you line everything up, the results are just, it, it adds an element that's hard to get because otherwise the things you're shooting, um, you know, you could have the face of a grasshopper in focus and the back end will be completely out of focus. So that's a challenge. So, uh, which would you recommend playing with first? I would say they're 100 millimeter that they have. I played with it some this summer in New York and I was just so pleased with how clean it is for um, intro macro photography. It's That's what I started with is that's a really good length because you don't have to get too close to things. You could shoot butterflies, you could shoot ants, you could shoot people. It takes really amazing portraits. So that's I think a really good one because it's, it's multifaceted. Some of the things that are really really zoomy you could say you can only shoot really small things. And so that's, if that's not what you want to shoot all the time, little jumping spiders or ants, those lenses sometimes don't work that well for people because you're very restricted. There's times I go out with some of those hyper macro lenses on at night. Some of the frogs I find are almost too big to be shot with that. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about what are the things you love to photograph. Is it little jumping spiders? Is it ants? Is it frogs? Is it butterflies? There's different lenses for that, but I think the, the 100 millimeter that they have is amazing. Um, for flash, so just your standard flash works, but the key thing with any flash is uh, the diffuser. So I've got a little diffuser here that I'm using, and um, basically what you want is some of my early photos, you can, in a lot of people's photos, you can really see the flash reflecting in the eye of a frog or of a insect because it's so harsh. So when you have a diffuser, that's when you get this really soft blanket light. And there's many DIY versions you can do. If you Google uh, homemade camera flash diffuser, there's all these really cool ones that you can make that cost maybe 15 bucks at the store. Um, I like to buy mine because I put them through some pretty strenuous work out there in the jungle. I just got this one that I've been playing with where you can see it kind of opens up and then there's another layer that goes up here and then I also have this that I could attach to my camera and to the flash so I could always have it off camera and move it around. I've seen a lot of people who keep the diffuser right on top of their lens, which works in a lot of shots, and it gives a really nice even glow. But for me, because I'm working in places where there's sticks and branches and leaves and that sort of thing that kind of get everywhere, it helps for me to have the flash independent so I can kind of move it around and get the right angle as I'm taking a shot of something. It's it's a little more challenging, but to me, it, it helps me really control the light and uh, get a better image. Um, let's see what else we got. Any other questions here? Those were some very good questions. Uh, so yeah, someone asked just about the light and all that. Um, light's obviously really important. And for video, one thing I found is working with a camera that has a very good low light sensor. So I have a uh, Panasonic GH5S that does really good in low light. Um, Sony also does really good in low light. And then I have an adapter that I could attach my lower lens that's made for Canon to my Panasonic camera. And um, I'm able to do that super high ISO filming, you know, 2500 ISO and still get a really good shot. So light's always tricky with these. But um, when taking photos, flash is your best friend and a really nice broad diffused flash. Once you start playing with that, you look at all your old photos and say, what was I even thinking? Because it, it really makes a big difference in coding the specimen you're working with with something amazing. And then when it comes to cameras, or sorry, video, I use big LED panels. So I have some that are maybe this big for small things. I have others that are about this big. I have some that are that big. Kind of depends what I'm trying to film. But shadows, when you're filming, that could be from your lens or something, are not your best friend. So a nice broad one can really help you. I have actually a giant one in front of me right now that's lighting me up. So it's, uh, it really makes a big difference. Um, so yeah, there's always little things to buy. It's, a, it's a, one of those hobbies that kind of gets to you over time in the best way where you say, okay, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to buy that. But I will say... Um, there was a lot of workarounds until Lawa came on the scene and really helped macro photographers and videographers just 
by the perfect wide angle lens or um, the perfect probe lens or the perfect macro. So it's they make it much more affordable and feasible to do this and to have that passion and to make these little mini discoveries of on video and on photos and share the things you love with people. And that's really why I said this at the beginning. Um, some of you may not have seen it because it was getting cut off, but uh, why I got into this in the first place is to share those little stories that I love a lot. The little stories about spiders and about frogs and about um, butterflies. You need the right lens to really be able to, to uh, see it from those little things perspective. And when I'm out there in the jungle, especially, I need good equipment that's going to be able to last and handle the weather. And so far, everything I've thrown at Laowa has, has done super well. Whether it's in my backyard, like right now during the coronavirus, I'm having a lot of fun just shooting stuff right around the home or when I'm out in the jungle. Um, all right, that's it for tonight. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let me see if there's anything I can uh, leave you with. I'll leave you with uh, this one here.